This is part three of the training video for the NeuroX physical and neurological examination. And here we're going to be looking in detail at the neurological examination. The first thing that should be said is that it is not our purpose in this neurological examination to carry out a completely comprehensive assessment of the kind that might be made by a clinical neurologist, nor do we seek to obtain diagnoses of neurological disorders. However, we do look at a wide range of different signs suggesting cortical, cerebellar, extrapyramidal or brainstem dysfunction. As such, we are hopefully able to pick up signs that may be suggestive of stroke, of Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease, as well as also general cortical damage that might, for example, result from Alzheimer's disease or other degenerative dementias. The specific components of the NeuroX neurological examination are, first of all, an assessment of up gaze, then an assessment of primitive reflexes that may be uh, present in infants in the early stages of brain development, but are then lost, but may reappear again in the presence of general neurodegeneration, for example, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And these are the glabella tap, the palmomental reflex and the pout reflex. Tremor may be a feature of Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. We look at drift and try to lateralize that to the left or right side, which may be a feature suggestive of previous stroke. We compare the tone in all four limbs and look and see whether that is pathologically increased. We look at coordination, which may be adversely effective in the presence of cerebellar disorder. We carry out two components of the Luria test battery that looks at features of frontal lobe dysfunction, and this is the palm fist side test and the reciprocal coordination test. And for each of these tests, there is a learning component and then a sequencing component. And finally, we compare the reflexes in all four limbs and also look for the presence or absence of a jaw reflex. Arguably, the neurological examination is the most complex and challenging component of the NeuroX, particularly for non-medically qualified or clinically experienced raters. This raises the question of does this part of the examination really need an accredited neurologist to carry it out? The whole philosophy of the NeuroX is that this is a completely structured examination capable of being carried out potentially by lay examiners for epidemiological studies when large numbers of participants are being examined uh, within the community and in their own homes. Therefore, for the most part, it wouldn't be possible to have an accredited neurologist or possibly even a medically qualified examiner. We have found in the past, in previous stages of the 1066 study, that the whole examination, including the neurological examination, can be carried out with reasonable quality uh, by lay examiners with no previous experience. But obviously this places a particular importance on the quality of the training and the amount of the supervision that the examiners and the assessors are given, particularly in the early stages of going out into the field. What non-clinicians lack is the experience of what is normal and what is abnormal. And in particular, they won't have seen uh, a large number of patients with abnormal neurological features. And so making the distinction between what is normal and what is abnormal may be somewhat difficult for them. In this training video, we have included clips from eTube made available by the University of California, San Francisco, showing neurological examinations of some potentially difficult to assess signs in order to give a clearer sense of what is normal and what is abnormal. During the training, the golden rule for the assessors is if they're in any doubt about whether something is normal or abnormal, they should always code normal. However, before making a code of normal under those circumstances, if in doubt, they should repeat the test again and see if they can elicit the sign once more. If the sign really is present, then it should be replicable. The next thing that they should do is carefully compare the two sides of the body, looking for asymmetry in the signs between the left and the right side. So, for example, it may be easier to understand if the reflexes are brisk, if the reflexes seem to be much brisker on one side of the body than on the other side of the body. The same may hold for tremor, the same may hold for drift. But do remember, however, that it is possible 
that there may be symmetrical signs indicating pathology and disease on both sides of the body. So, for example, strokes might have affected both sides of the body, leading to brisk reflexes in the left leg and in the right leg. Or in Parkinson's disease, tremor may be present on one side of the body only, or it may be present on both. The neurological examination part of the NeuroX. Um, and this is a more technical examination, but again, if you follow all of the rules and the guidance in this video, um, both as to how one administers the examination and also as how one rates the signs as being present or absent, um, then again, you will do a good job uh, with this part of the examination. So the first thing that we're going to be looking at um, is the eyes and the movements of the eyes. And specifically, we're going to see whether the participant is able to look up um, and follow a finger in front of their face. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, please follow my finger, but keep your head still. What it may be easiest to do for this purpose, if I may just put my hand on your head like so, is that just gently you can steady the participant's head like that, um, and I can say to you, holding the finger here, um, about 30 centimetres uh, in front of the participant's eyes, say, please follow my finger, but keep your head still. And as we lift the finger up, look at the eyes. And we'll just do that one more time. So please follow my finger, but keep your head still. There we are. And hopefully you can see on the video there that Caroline's eyes actually look up and clearly follow the finger as I move it to the extent of her gaze. And that is completely normal. So under those circumstances, I would code zero for normal up gaze. Um, if the participant has difficulty in following uh, the finger right up to the limit, then that would be a limited up gaze, or one. Um, if the participant was not able to uh, lift their eyes up to follow the finger at all, then that would be a score of two, or no up gaze, or almost no up gaze. So we're now going to test uh, what are sometimes called uh, primitive reflexes, uh, because these are reflexes which are often present in babies at the early developmental stage, but then should disappear um, as the brain develops. But sometimes with people who have problems with um, brain degenerative conditions, these primitive reflexes uh, appear again. They're actually very simple to elicit, and the first one of these is called the glabella tap. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tap the participant's forehead just between the eyes and just above the bridge of their nose. Um, and I'm going to keep on tapping like this um, until they stop blinking. And it's perfectly normal for the person to um, blink once or twice when you tap like that. Um, but after a couple of taps, they should stop blinking. But some people, they just keep on blinking. So this is what we're going to look at here. And we're going to code how many taps it takes until the participant stops blinking. So I'm just, if I may, if you could look uh, forward again for me again, I'm just going to tap gently on your forehead. So I would have said that, uh, in this case, Carolina blinked about twice, but let's just try that once more, so again. Actually, I would have said that she blinked once on that occasion, so that's completely normal, and you see that one to four taps are coded one, so that would be the code for the Glabella tap. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to try and elicit um, the pout reflex. So this is when babies are feeding at the breast. Their natural reflex is if something is put to their lips, then they pout like this. So uh, we're going to see if this reflex is present or absent. Um, and what you need to say is, I'm going to just put my finger to your lips and then tap, if that's all right. So there we are. So. The power reflex was not present there, and that's what one would expect, that is normal. Um, but if you do see a pout, like this, um, then the power reflex is present. If you're in doubt whether it's present or absent, you can tap as I did there more than once, um, and that will give you a clear sense of this. If the power reflex is present, every time you try and elicit it, you should see it, and it's very clear cut 
uh, when participants do have that. We're now going to try the Palmo Mental Reflex. Um, and this is called the Palmo Mental Reflex because it's when the palm is scratched uh, that then sometimes uh, you will see a little twitch um, on the chin and on the side of the mouth. If you're in doubt about whether this is absent or present, then repeat the scratching, because again, if somebody has a palmar mental reflex, every time you try and elicit it, you should see the sign. And what you need to be doing is that it's the sign that you scratch, you should be looking at the lips and the chin here for the sign of the twitch uh, every time you make that scratch. Now, I should stress here that when one is doing this, uh, one doesn't, I'm talking about scratching the hand, but one does not want to cause any damage and one needs to be careful about that. Um, it may be okay uh, if this is not too sharp, and actually this is rather a sharp one, so I don't think we're going to use this, uh, to use the end of the tendon hammer for this purpose, but that is a little bit too sharp and pointed uh, and of course could, could cause problems. So uh, often what is better for this purpose is to actually use keys instead. And if you can find on your key ring uh, a key which is not too sharp, isn't going to cause injury, try it out on yourself first of all and just check that it's not painful and you're not actually uh, scratching. Um, and then you can use that for the purpose. So if that's okay with you, I'm just going to make a little scratch on your hand. It won't hurt. Um, so what you need to be doing is you need to be scratching the ulnar border of the hand. That's the side of the hand which has the little finger. So here we go. Um, and there we are. Okay, didn't hurt? No. And you can see I was doing that, but there was no responding reflex there um, at all. And that is completely normal. So that would be coded as no facial twitch or zero. Uh, if there was a facial twitch, then you would, under those circumstances, record one. Now we're going to be looking at tremor, and we're going to be looking um, at signs for tremor in general, um, and we're going to be looking specifically at whether there is any uh, tremor at the level of the head and the neck, um, and whether there is any tremor in the right upper limb and in the left upper limb. So for this purpose, what we need to do, we don't need to say anything to the participants at all, we just need to make an observation. But we may just, uh, if I can ask you just to completely relax your hands like this. So we just simply sit here for a moment and we observe. So we observe the head, and if there is a head tremor, then it can be this sort of thing that I'm demonstrating at the moment. Um, if it is an arm tremor, then it may be, if you look at my hand down here, you can see a little tremor going on in my right hand. And remember that for the arms, one is coding the tremor as being present uh, separately. Can you see a tremor in the right hand? Can you see a tremor um, in the left hand? And for each of these tremors, if they're uh, not present, it's no tremor or zero. If you do see a tremor, for example, of the right hand, it can either be a slow tremor, like I'm demonstrating here, a medium tremor, which is a little bit more rapid, um, or alternatively, a fast tremor, which will then really be a very fast rhythm like this. So get a sense of what speed is, code it slow, medium, or fast, uh, if it is present. The tremor of Parkinson's disease is most typically asymmetric in its presentation and most prominent at rest. It has a slower frequency of around 4 to 6 hertz and has a pill rolling or pronation supination character to it. This first gentleman has tremor predominant idiopathic Parkinson's disease. You can see he has a very asymmetric tremor with his right upper extremity rest tremor, almost no tremor at all on the left. He also motioned towards his right shoulder to show that he probably has some stiffness there, again on the most symptomatic side, the right side. There you can see a very rolling, pill rolling form of the tremor. We're now going to look for signs of drift. Um, and this can be a sign uh, of a previous stroke that the participant might have experienced. It's a very easy sign to test for. And what you need to do for this is ask the participant to put their hands up like so 
um, and then to close their eyes. Um, and when they close their eyes, if drift is present, what you'll see on my right hand here is the hand coming over and the hand coming down and over towards the midline. The participant with their eyes closed is not actually aware um, that this is happening. Um, so let's just see how this works. So Carolina, if I could ask you just to put your hands up, turn your palms up like that, and I wonder if you could just now close your eyes, please, and keep your arms steady. There we are. So that's absolutely fine. There's clearly no drift here. Thank you very much indeed. What you do need to check is, as the participant puts their arms up, that it's comfortable for them to hold that position. Because, of course, if you have arthritis or pain in your shoulder, then it may be that you're not able to hold the arm up. Uh, but even under those circumstances, it's unlikely that you get the classic drift with the arm hand coming over and the arm coming down uh, in that way. That's what we're looking for. And again, as with all of these neurological signs, if you're in doubt, code it as normal. Only if you think that the classic sign, as we have demonstrated, is present, should you code drift as being present. With the drift, either there is drift or there is not drift, uh, and then if there is drift, you code which side the drift is most prominent, the right side uh, or the left-hand side. So we now come to the tests of tone in the limbs. And what we're going to do here is we're going to test the muscle tone in both arms and in both legs. Um, and what's important is that we test the tone both as far as flexion of the limb is concerned and the joint, and also extension um, of the limb or the joint. And what we're going to be coding here is either that the tone is normal, uh, that it is slightly increased, uh, or that it is very stiff with much increased tone. And we're going to be coding this for um, the right upper limb, uh, the right lower limb, the left upper limb, and the left lower limb. So let's just first of all um, show you how it is that you try and test the tone. Uh, and what we're going to start off with is the right um, upper limb. And so if I could just take your arm here, and can I ask you just to completely relax your arm and let me move it around. So you can just do like this so that you can feel um, that the participant's arm is completely relaxed. And already I'm beginning to test the tone. But now it's like I'm shaking a hand here and I'm just testing the tone here. And then at the elbow I can test the flexion and the extension like this. And at the wrist I can test the flexion and the extension. And this is the pronation and the supination. And this feels lovely and relaxed. I'm not having to put any extra effort into this at all. But if you stiffen up for me a bit, and oh, this is now quite difficult, and it's actually quite stiff, and there clearly is quite a lot of increased tone here. Now, what you can find, if there is both tremor and increased tone or rigidity, um, then instead of being just a constant increased tone, so that you're always having to put more effort into moving the participant's arm or hand, what you find is so-called cogwheeling rigidity. And it's called cogwheeling because there's increased tone and then it gives a bit, increased tone and it gives. And so when you try and make the movement, it's not steady, it's like this. It's this increased tone and then giving all the time. And so this is called cogwheeling rigidity. So we have two types of increased tone, the steady increased tone like this, and then we have the cogwheeling rigidity here where it gives and then there's the increased tone and the tension. So again, just to remind ourselves how we do this for the upper arm, nice and relaxed, there we are, and pronation and supination, the flexion and extension at the wrist, the flexion and the extension at the elbow, there we are, uh, we've tested the tone in that arm. We do the same thing in the left arm, and in particular what I'm asking you to look out for here is whether the tone feels the same in the left arm or the right arm. Um, again, if you're in doubt, then code normal tone if you're not sure that it's increased. Uh, but one sign of possible increased tone in one arm may be that the tone definitely feels a bit stiffer, say, in the right arm than when I test in the left arm. But bear in mind, sometimes you may find that the tone is actually increased equally in both of the two arms. Now, we're also now going to do the same thing uh, with the legs. 
and usually the participant will be sitting down, and neurologists would say quite rightly uh, that it's best to do this examination with the participant lying down, um, but that's something that's often quite difficult to achieve. So what we can do here, if I can just take your leg for a moment, um, it's easiest to test here at the knee. It's best to check, do you have any pain in the joint, in the knee at all, that would give you any discomfort if I move it around? If not, we're just here testing the flexion and the extension in the knee, and it's nice, you can see the knee, the leg here, just swinging. It's important that you take the weight of it here, um, so that then we can just test the tone really easily there, um, and then we can do the same thing, because remember that we're doing it on both sides, no pain at all in this knee joint, uh, just testing it out, and there again, just nice and reduced tone. There we are. So, uh, that is testing the tone, and remember that you are uh, coding both for rigidity in general, uh, and then for the presence or absence of cogwheeling in the right upper limb, the arm, the right lower limb, the leg, the left upper limb, the arm, and the left lower limb, the leg. So, after testing the tone, we now move on to testing coordination. <coughs> and so, what we're going to do here, I did actually ask earlier, but we're now going to uh, code this formally. Uh, which hand do you use for writing when you were younger? My right hand. Right hand. So, um, it may be if the person hasn't learned to write that you need to think of another culturally appropriate question. Uh, to determine which is the dominant hand. So right-handed. Uh, we're going to test fine finger movement. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to ask the participant to oppose their thumb with their index finger, their first finger, their second finger, and their ring finger, uh, and their small finger. Uh, and we're going to do that uh, repeatedly. So when you demonstrate it to the participant, you need to practice this yourself. You need to go like this. There we are. Okay. Uh, and so what I'm demonstrating is how it should be done normally, um, but some participants may be slow and or clumsy. So that would definitely be slow and or clumsy compared with the much smoother technique that I've shown you there. So, um, can I show you uh, a movement and then ask you please to repeat it? Um, first of all, you said you were right hand. Can you show me with your right hand? I'd like you just please to do that for me repeatedly. Very good. And could you do the same thing with your left hand now, please? There we are. If the participant is confused about the task, you may need to show them again and put them right and then ask them to do it uh, once more. So we're now going to test another aspect of coordination, um, dystiadocokinesis. And uh, for this, what I'm going to do is to show a movement to the participant, ask them to repeat it. Um, I have the, I'm left-handed, so I have my right hand here flat on my leg, and I'm going to use my left arm, and I'm going to um, press with the palm, and then the back of the hand. And so just turning the hand like this, and you ask the participant to do it as quickly and as smoothly as they can. And once they've done it with one hand, they then do it with the other. So, uh, I'm now going to ask you just to do some repeated movements with your hands. First of all, what I'd like you to do, please, um, is to put your left hand on your left leg, like so, and then with your right hand, just do this movement, the back of the hand and then the palm, uh, as quickly and as smoothly as you can. There we are. So that is obviously a normal rate, uh, and again, one is coding here for slowness and clumsiness, so if it seems slow, uncoordinated, or clumsy, you code a 1, um, otherwise, as in that case, it's normal. And you then ask the participants to do the same with their other hand, so put your right hand on your right leg, and then that's fine. So both the left hand and the right hand there were um, completely normal. Dystiodokinesia is the impairment of alternating movements, such as pronation, supination, or the movement of the hands um, in rapid alternating movements. Somebody with dystiodokinesis due to a cerebellar problem will often have irregularity in the movement. Somebody with Parkinsonism just might be very slow but would be regular. And it's usually the irregularity that is more of a cerebellar problem. 
So the next two tests are from the Luria battery, uh, testing frontal lobe and executive function. And these two tests have several features in common. The first is that we first of all teach the participant to carry out the action. And we repeat the demonstration of the action until they've been able to perform it accurately. And we're allowed to carry out up to five re-demonstrations while they're learning how to perform the function. At that time, we code whether or not they have learned to perform the function. If they can't learn to perform the function, we don't then move on to the next stage, which is the sequencing. That is, whether they can then go on and repeat the function that we've shown to them five times over. During the sequencing stage, if they make a mistake while they're doing it, then we can stop them and then re-demonstrate just once how the function is to be performed correctly. And then again, we ask them whether they can go on and repeat the function five times. So we're now going to show the first one of these tests from the Luria battery, which is called the fist palm side test. Now, you should be asking the participant to carry out these functions using their dominant hand. Uh, and we've already established that Carolina's dominant hand is her right hand, so this is what she's going to be using for the test. Um, I'm left-handed, so I'm going to be demonstrating this with my left hand. So, the fist palm side involves, first of all, the fist, and then the palm, flat down on the thigh, and then the side of the palm against the leg. So what you need to do is to demonstrate to the participant fist, palm, side. You don't actually say those words when you're doing the function. So actually what you should show them is... So let us now administer this and see how Carolina does with this task. Carolina, using your right hand, I want you to watch my hand movements and then repeat them after I have finished. So please watch carefully. Could you please repeat that for me? That's fine. Thank you very much. I would now like you to repeat those movements five times, please. Thank you very much. So that was a perfect test. So on this occasion, I would code for the learning zero, that is, requires only one demonstration, and for the sequencing, I would also record zero, which is five sequences correct. And you can see that for the learning, if it needed two to three demonstrations before Carolina had learned, that would be coded a one. If she needed four or five demonstrations, it would be coded a two. Um, if, however, she was unable to learn this correctly within five demonstrations, that would then be coded a three. And because she hadn't learned, we wouldn't then go on to do the sequencing. For the sequencing, um, if she just made a single error, then we would code a 1. If we needed to re-demonstrate to her, but she'd still then after that managed to complete the five sequences, that would be coded a 2. But if she was unable to perform the five repetitions, then that would be coded a 3. So we'll now come on to the second one of these tests, uh, which is reciprocal coordination. And for this, you need to be using both of your hands. And what we're doing here is that we are altering uh, alternating um, the palm upwards on the thigh and the fist clench like this downwards um, and we're changing over from one hand to the other. So I'll just demonstrate this to the camera first of all. So you may need to practice that a little bit yourself first of all to make sure that you can show the sequence to the participant properly. And then you would say to the participant I want you now to watch my hand movements again and then repeat them uh, after I have finished. Could you please repeat what I've just done? Thank you. So that's fine. So Carolina learned that on the first attempt, so we'll now go on and say and now I want you to repeat those movements five times, please.
that's fine. So again, Carolina was able to repeat those movements accurately five times. Um, and the coding for uh, this task is exactly the same as the coding for the palm, fist, side task that we just completed earlier. So you code the learning uh, according to the number of demonstrations that were required in order for the participant to be able to perform the task. Uh, you code the sequencing uh, according to whether it was done correct uh, straight away, whether it was performed with one mistake, uh, whether it could only be done properly after one re-demonstration, uh, or if the participant was unable to complete the five sequences correctly. So we're now at the stage where we're going to be looking at tendon reflexes. Um, and tendon reflexes really are um, best tested uh, with the participant lying down, if that can be achieved, if there's a bed um, where they can do that. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate is, first of all, the technique for testing tendon reflexes um, if the participant is seated. Uh, and so what you need for this purpose is a tendon hammer. And the most important thing, as far as this tendon hammer is concerned, is that you should not use the tendon hammer to hit the participant's arm or leg directly. You should only be hitting them through your fingers. So the tendon hammer strikes your finger, um, and then through that, the force is transmitted um, onto the tendon. And what should be happening here is that when the tendon is compressed in that way, it causes a reflex muscle jerk. Um, and so, for example, if we hit the tendon here, uh, then we will elicit uh, the brachioradialis reflex here in the lower arm. And what you're going to be uh, testing is the biceps jerk, um, the jaw jerk, and the knee jerk. Those are the uh, three reflexes that we're going to be uh, enlisting in this case. So we'll start off with the biceps jerk. So this is the biceps muscle here. This is the one that we're going to want to elicit the reflex in. Um, and the tendon of the biceps um, is just here on the outer arm. And so what we do is completely important that the arm is totally relaxed here as with the tone of test. So just let your arm go floppy on your side there. Um, and then take aim and hit your fingers. And watch the hand down here and also the muscle here. And I think that you can see um, as I hit my finger there that one has an answering reflex and we have a little jerk here um, of the hand. Now what we're coding here um, is whether uh, the reflex is normal, and that was a normal reflex there, whether it was brisk normal or pathological brisk. And when a reflex is pathologically brisk, and I'll ask um, Carolina here to demonstrate this, even just a little tap will elicit a very big reflex. So I'm just going to do a little tap here. And we could get even a sharper reflex. Whoa, there we go. Whoa, I only have to just tap a little bit. It's very, very reactive indeed. You can see that actually to elicit Carolina's normal reflex, um, I had to actually make quite a, a big hit here on my fingers and one just gets a little bit of a reflex response. Sometimes when the reflex is very brisk, just tapping on the tendon like that with your finger uh, can be enough to actually elicit uh, the reflex response. And so, um, again, unless you're completely sure that it really is much, much brisker than normal, um, you should just be coding it as a normal reflex. Um, sometimes you just can't elicit the reflex, uh, that's not necessarily abnormal, uh, but under those circumstances it's a score of zero. Um, if it's a normal reflex it's one, if it's a brit brisk it's two, uh, if you really think it's abnormally brisk then that would be a score of three. So what we're doing is we're eliciting the reflex here, uh, the left biceps reflex, we then come around the other side, uh, and again if you just let your arm completely relax, uh, the right biceps reflex, there we are. Um, and what you need to be doing here, again, is compare the left and the right side. So do the biceps on the right first, then do the biceps on the left. And if one is much brisker than the other, then that may be a, a normally brisk or pathologically brisk reflex on this other side. So we've tested the normally reflexes in the arm. Now what we're going to do is we're going to test for the jaw reflex. Um, and what this means is we're going to tap Carolina's jaw, but obviously we need to be cautious about how we do this. Um, so Carolina, can I just ask you to let your uh, mouth open and your jaw sag for a moment? 
in here, that's it, nice and relaxed. And I'm going to put my finger just here, just below the lip, and really quite gently, I'm just going to tap here, like this. So you really need to make sure here that you're not uh, in any danger whatsoever of hitting the participant. It's your finger that you're hitting. Um, and there should not be a jaw reflex. If there is a jaw reflex, that is abnormal. Uh, and people that have had strokes in particular affecting both sides of the brain, you can elicit, even with quite a gentle tap like that, a very clear answering jaw reflex where the jaw closes up quite sharply and you can feel it against your finger um, as the jaw responds in the reflex there. So there was no jaw movement there. Uh, we'll just demonstrate that once again if you let your jaw just sag. Uh, and we're not doing it hard, we're just going like this, and there is no jaw reflex response there. Good. Now, the hardest reflex to elicit uh, when the participant is seated um, is the knee reflex. Um, this really is quite tricky. Uh, if you can let your leg relax as much as possible, um, the issue here is that you need to just let it relax and your leg swing for me there. Uh, you need to support the weight of the leg and you need to, there we go, just here, if you see, just let it relax. Uh, and you put your hand on the tendon, which is below the kneecap, just below the kneecap, you'll feel the tendon there, nice and relaxed. Nice and relaxed. And I'm not really able to elicit the reflex there. Um, if that reflex was brisk, then even doing it in that way, I think we would have elicited it. Let's just try on the other side. So we're trying the same thing. If I take the weight of your leg, let your leg swing and go floppy there, and then the thumb there on the tendon, and really we're not getting much there at all. And that's understandable. It just is very, very difficult to elicit unless it is pathologically brisk uh, when the participant is sitting down. So what I will do, if Carolina won't mind, uh, in a participant's home, you would not ask the participant to lie down <laughs> on, their, on the ground. <laughs> you would do this on a couch or a bed, but hopefully uh, Carolina won't mind. And if you could just lie down for me for a moment, be nice and relaxed, very good. Um, and then if you let your arm just go completely floppy over your side here, there we are. And you can see that this is actually a little bit easier uh, to elicit the reflexes this way. So here we go. Good. And then for the um, leg reflexes, again, it's more straightforward. If I could just lift your leg up for you for a moment. There we are. Very good. Just nice and relaxed there. That's it. And just gently, it may be just nice and gently, you can actually on this occasion just the reflex. Again, we're not getting much there with the lower legs, but this is really quite normal in a younger person. Okay, if I just take the weight there. Yeah, okay, so that's fine. So we didn't elicit the leg reflexes, but if those were brisk, then we would have done so. That's fine, thank you very much indeed. So I think I would have coded there for uh, the right biceps uh, a score of 1 for normal, left biceps a score of 1 for normal, um, the uh, right knee and the left knee I would have coded as absent, which is uh, normal, as I said, in a younger person. Hyperreflexia can be demonstrated in the patella reflex. Uh, in this case, the patient has suffered a stroke affecting the left side of the brain. Um, the patella tendon extends from below the patella, which is right here. Um, it's a broad band of tissue. It's easily palpable. If you're not sure where it is, have the patient extend their leg, which will cause the tendon to shorten. And you can strike directly on the tendon. And thus reflexes are very brisk. Um, and in fact, there are a few extra beats of movement, which are referred to as clonus. Again, classic for an upper motor neuron syndrome. In cases like this, the reflex can be elicited by simply tapping on the tendon often. See, the same reflex requires very little stimulus. Compared again with the normal side, patella tendon, again extending from below the patella. Strike on the tendon. 
So and that would be a normal reflex and certainly diminished compared with the side that's hyperreflexing. 